Okay, get a choir another hand, y'all. <clears throat> Praise to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everyone that's here in the name of Jesus. Peace to everyone that's online watching us. And peace to everyone that's on the phone line. If there's anybody on there, I don't know. But as always, it's good to stand you, stand before you on this day, the Lord's Sabbath day, which he commanded us to have a holy convocation in spite of everything that's going on outside around us, we're going um, we to do this because the Lord commanded us. So the title of the lesson <clears throat> is The True Servants of God Fight the Good Fight of Faith. And that's a testament within itself because when you start serving the one and true living God, it's, you, gonna, you got a battle on your hands. And you have a battle with everyone around you to prove why you're doing what you're doing. Because serving the one true living God is out of the norm in today's society. Because the world is backwards. But we're going to see what the true servants of God, what they have to go through in order to maintain their beliefs. And if you go down for the count one time and you stay down, it's a done deal for you. Okay? Because the Lord says a, a righteous man will fall seven times. But he always gets back up. There's no problem with, with falling. Just don't stay down. Get back up. Because the Bible says in Ezekiel, if you turn away from your righteousness and you commit iniquity and you die in your iniquity, all that righteousness is a done deal. It's gone. So let's read. Let's go to Matthew 10. We're going to go to Matthew 10, and we're going to see where your first fight starts at. Matthew 10. And let's pick it up at verse 34. Okay, go ahead. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So Jesus says, think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And that sword is none other than the, the truth. Which is, the, which is the word of God. And when you start following this truth, you're going to have some division in your household. Mothers against daughters, fathers against sons. And verse 36 says what? And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. So the first line of defense starts in your own house. That's where your first good fight starts. It's a good fight on your behalf, but on them, they ain't trying to hear it. But it says that in the Bible. That's the way it's going to be when you start serving the one true living God. Because there is no difference between this denomination or that denomination. When you start denominational hopping, they don't care. Because you want you listening, you wanted somebody to scratch your ear. So you may go to this church or this church or this church just so they could tell you something that you want to hear. But when you start serving the true living God and you stop doing sun worship, and you start keeping the Sabbath day, now the fight is on. Before it wasn't no problem. But now you're keeping the Sabbath day and you can read it. Now you got a problem within your household. Mm -hmm. So we got, and we, there's evidence of that because you got people that's married up in here. They here, but their spouse isn't. That's a division right there. There should be no problem. Every seat out there should be filled. But when you start dealing with this truth, the fight is on. Keep reading. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So if you love your parents or your siblings or your children more than you love the Lord, Jesus said, I don't need you. You ain't worthy of me because... You're going to have to stand and walk with me. And if you don't, lake of fire is waiting on you. Matthew 12. Flip over to Matthew 12. Matthew 12, we're going to start at verse 46. Okay, go ahead. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, 
desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. So at the same time when you have enemies within your own household because of this word, you get a new family now. The people that's in the word with you. Because Jesus said, who is my brother and who is my, who is my mother and who is my brethren? For whosoever shall do the will of my father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. So we all brothers and sisters and mamas and papas up in here. One spiritual family. And we all going through the same thing dealing with this word. We all fighting. Whether it's at work, at home, or even out there on the street, you're fighting a good fight for this word right here. Skip up to verse 25. Read verse 25. Go ahead. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. So that's the same thing with the word of God. We see the enemies are going to be within your household. And we know that house will not stand. It will not stand divided. Eventually, the person that's going against you is going to come on and jump on the wagon with you. Otherwise, they gone. But that's the way it's going to be. The truth always wins. You just got to endure. The truth always wins. As long as you and your spouse are together, believe me, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, they'll come around. But you got to fight the good fight. You got to put forth that effort and show some fruits, show some works that you mean serious business about this book. Because if you go off the path just one time, they just waiting. I got you. See? I knew that Bible wasn't what it's supposed to be. They just looking for an excuse to get you. Skip down to verse 30 and read that one. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So that's some plain words from Jesus. There's no, no great area in between that. If you're not with Jesus, you're against him. That's it. You're either for him or you're against him. That's, that's the, there's nothing in between that. If you love him, you're going to keep his commandments. If you don't love him, you're not going to keep him. And that's evident right there. Look what's going on outside right now. Amen. Nobody even thinking about the Sabbath day. Let's go to um, Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to get to some fighting in a minute. Because it's all examples all throughout this Bible of how the servants of the Lord stood up, got slapped around, beat up. Why? Because of what they believed in. Revelation 2, read that one verse, verse 26. Go ahead. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. So he that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end, he's going to get power over the nations. This is not no 12-round fight right here. This is a fight for your life <laughs> to the death, to the end. This ain't no boxing, man. You got to fight every day for the rest of your life. Every day. And you got to overcome. Whatever adversities that come towards you, you got to overcome it. Because you're standing for this word. You are a representative of the servant of the Lord. And they're just waiting for you to slip one time just so they can talk about you. Let's go to um, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And you know you're serving the Lord because he said in the, in the, in the, in the, in the scriptures that we just read that you're going to have some enemies. Because you're serving the Lord and you're doing what you're supposed to do. So if you got enemies, that means you're going to do some suffering. 2 Timothy 3, and read that one verse. Yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer. It didn't say you're going to be blessed and highly favored. <laughs> it said you're going to suffer. Your family going to hate you. Your friends going to hate you. That's some suffering. The people that you grew up with all your life. Amen. All of a sudden, you want to do what's right. And now they hate you. And that's suffering. And the books say if you're going to live right, you're going to suffer. 
Let's go to um, Jeremiah 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. And let's look at some of the examples of how the servants of the Lord, they didn't give up. No matter what adversities they were going through, they didn't give up. They might have questioned their motives for a minute, but once they came to their senses, they shipped that question out. Jeremiah 20, and pick it up at verse 1. Go ahead. Now Pashur, the son of Yemer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pashur smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. So here's Jeremiah doing what thus said the Lord. And he got busted in the mouth for it. Go ahead. And it came to pass on the morrow that Pashur brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then said Jeremiah unto him, The Lord hath called, the Lord hath not called thy name Pashur, but Megar Misabib. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city, and all the labors thereof, and all the precious things thereof, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah will I give into the hand of their enemies, which shall spoil them, and take them, and carry them into Babylon. And thou, Pashur, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity, and thou shalt come to Babylon, and there thou shalt die, and shalt be buried there, thou and all thy friends, to whom thou hast prophesied lies. So if somebody pop you in the mouth and lock you up, you, you should be quiet, shouldn't you? But not a servant of the Lord. Jeremiah told him exactly what was going to happen to him, his family, and what's going to happen to the city. Usually if you hit somebody, they should shut up, right? Not a servant of the Lord. But go ahead, verse 7. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily, everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and could not stay. So much for not trying to speak what thus saith the Lord. You are compelled to do it. Amen. You are compelled to speak what's written in this Bible to anybody, especially your family and your friends. You can try to hold it in all you want, hmm. but like Jeremiah said, it was burning. Yeah. You gotta say something. Somebody say something stupid, check them. They gotta be checked. If you're a true servant of the Lord, you ain't gonna let nothing go by crazy. They can sit up there and talk Christmas all they want. But when you come to me, you ask the wrong person then. You should have just kept your mouth shut. I wouldn't have said nothing. But you messed up. Now I'm going to put it on the table. Let's go to Ezekiel 4. So we see what some of the things Jeremiah went through, and that's just one of them. He went through a lot. But he ended up getting busted in the mouth and thrown in jail just for speaking the word. But that didn't stop him, though. He still kept speaking with thus said the Lord. And let's look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel 4, and pick it up at verse 1. Okay, go ahead. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile, and lay it before thee, and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem, and lay siege against it, and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it, set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, According to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it, it thou shalt, it, it thou shalt bear their iniquity. 
For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days, 390 days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So Ezekiel had to lay on his side for 390 days. Go ahead. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arms shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to, the, uh, to another, till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. So he had to lay on this side for 390 days, and he had to lay on this side for 40 days. That's a servant of the Lord. Did he question that? Nope. Some of us might have questioned it. You know, laying on your side preaching for 390 days, and then you got to flip over on this side and preach for 40 days. But this is a servant of the Lord. He's got to fight the good fight. Go ahead. Take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches, fitches and put them one vessel and make thee bread thereof according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side. 390 days shalt thou eat thereof. And thy meat which thou shalt eat shall be by weight 20 shekels a day. From time to time shalt thou eat it. Thou shalt drink also water by measure, the sixth part of the hen. From time to time shalt thou drink. And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. And the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whither I will drive them. So he, that's good on that. He said, um, verse 12, And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of a man in their sight. So you're supposed to make your barley cakes with human waste. Mm -hmm. This is what we're reading, right? Mm -hmm. Keep reading. Then said I, Ah, O Lord God, behold, my soul hath not been polluted. For from my mouth, from my youth, up even till now, have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself, or is torn into pieces. Neither came there an abominable flesh into my mouth. Then he said unto me, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. So Ezekiel, he had the question there. Lord, what's your motive now? Yeah. I know you the God of Israel, but come on now, making my barley cakes with human waste? So he was like, all right, I'll give you cow's dung then. But you still going to make it with some dung. You going to make it with some waste, partner. Now let's go to um, Isaiah 20. Boy, they don't let up, do they? Isaiah chapter 20. We should put some speakers outside so they can hear this. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 20. And let's look at Isaiah. And this is some of the stuff the prophets went through to serve the Lord. And this ain't nothing compared to, you know, I mean, what, are they, what they're doing now is nothing compared to, you know, what we got to go through. You know, slap around a little bit, people talk about you. But look what Isaiah had to do. Isaiah 20, and read verse 2 and 3. Go ahead. At the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah through the son of Amos, saying, Go and, and loose the sackcloth from thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. So Isaiah had to walk naked and bed for three years. And this is what the Lord instructed him to do. And he told him to do that. And Isaiah didn't even question it. Now, you see a naked man walking around there, you ain't going to listen to him. You're going to think the dude is crazy. Lock him up. But this was a servant of the Lord. And the Lord told him to do this. Let's go to um, 2 Samuel. Now, we know what happened to David. He slept with Bathsheba, and the Lord tore up his household. But even then, David took his punishment. He failed at one time, but he didn't stay down. The Lord forgave him, but he didn't forget. He told him exactly what was going to happen to him, and David had to watch his household fall apart. But even while he was going through his suffering, he did not bat an eye one time. And look at what happened with this guy that was really, I mean, this guy wasn't nothing to David. But he still had to endure what the Lord had chastened him with. 2 Samuel 16 
Now let's pick it up at verse 5. Because this is when Absalom had ran him out. And David was pretty much, you know, a vagabond just walking around. He couldn't go back home because Absalom, his son, had destroyed it. Sleeping with his concubines. But look, look at this guy. 2 Samuel 16. And pick it up at verse 5. Go ahead. And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man and thou man of Belial. Then the Lord hath returned upon thee, upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. So now David, he's at his lowest point right now, okay? One of his sons was killed. His daughter was raped by that son and his other son and ran him out. So he at his lowest point. And this guy, Shimei, he remembered what David did to Saul and how Saul's household got messed up, but that was on Saul's part. He did that on his own. But now he's going to come out. He's cursing David, you know, throwing, throwing rocks at him. That would tick anybody off. But what did David do? Verse 9, go ahead. Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said unto Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction, and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way of Shimei, went along on his hillside over against him, and cursed as he went, and threw stones at him, and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. So you see what's going on. David and his mighty men, now these dudes could take that dude out at any time. But David had to humble himself, and he had to take his punishment because he messed up. He fell, he got up, dusted himself off, but he still had some punishment coming. And that's when you don't want to fall when you're being punished. When the Lord is chastising you, accept your punishment. Do not go against what the Lord is, is putting on you. He's going to bring some drama in your life to see if you really want to do this battle. Do you really want to fight this good fight? Do you really want to stick with me knowing that your family's going to come against you and they're going to talk about you? Is this what you really want to do? Don't go out in the first round. Because we're going to read what some people went out in the first round, some people went out in the second round, third round, and they never got back up. But then you got some that's going to take this fight all the way to the end. And that's what we got to do. We got to fight all the way to the end. Go to 2 Samuel 10. Flip back to 2 Samuel 10. Let's look at what this guy did to some of David's servants. 2 Samuel 10, and pick it up at verse 1. Go ahead. And it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanan his son reigned in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanan the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. So David got some good intentions, okay? He want to be kind to this guy like his father was kind to him. Go ahead. And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanan, their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city, to spy it out, and to overthrow it? Wherefore Hanan took David's servants, and shaved off the one half of their beards, and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed, 
And the king said, tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return. So now he sent them servants with good intentions. And what did that king do to them? Shaved off half their beard and cut their pants up to their buttocks. They was walking around with half the booty hanging out and half a beard. Now that's humiliating. Now these are mighty men. Now they took yeah. this. They had to take this humiliation, but they ended up getting paid back, you know. The Lord didn't let that go by too long. They ended up getting paid back, but they had to take that. As a servant of the Lord, they had to take that humiliation. But because the Lord was on their side, he repaid, brought the recompense upon their own head. And you can read that later. Let's go to Job 1. Because serving the Lord... Sometimes people do stuff to you you wouldn't even expect just because you're serving the Lord. They make it a point to call it your Sabbath day, like they mocking you. You know, you ain't mocking you, you're mocking the Lord because this is not my Sabbath day. Job 1, and let's pick it up at verse 6 because let's see what happened to Job because Job, he went through a lot of stuff. But he didn't waver one time. Job 1, pick it up at verse 6. Go ahead. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and the substance is increased in the land. But put, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So Job was living good. The Lord was blessing him on all sides. But it never went to his head. He knew where he got his blessings from. And when those blessings started leaving, let's see what happened to Job. Go ahead, verse 13. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yeah, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out of three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yeah, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I am only escaped alone to tell thee. So you see there's drama after drama after drama coming in Job's life, and he was living good for a minute. And all of a sudden, bad things started happening. I mean, real bad things. His kids got killed. His livestock is gone. His servants got killed. But what did Job do? Verse 20, go ahead. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So no matter how things got bad for Job, he still got up and brushed himself off. He didn't say nothing stupid to offend God. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. I was working with this guy, and his son, his younger son, had got killed. And he was mad at God. You know, why did God do this to me? So he just stopped going to church. You know, he was a sun worshiper, but 
stopped going to church for like six or seven years. You know, he was just mad at God mm -hmm. for what had happened to his son. I'm like, man, dude, you know, I was listening. When he told me that, I, all I could think about was Job, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, you, you, <laughs> you don't be getting mad at God, man. That's the wrong person to be mad at. You should have been mad at yourself. But anyway, let's go to Job chapter 2. Did we finish that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Job 2, right into Job 2. And pick it up at verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast to his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause? And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yeah, all that a man hath he will give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot until his crown. And he took him a potsherd of scrape, and he took him a potsherd to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. And he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. So Job had an infirmity. Satan put some kind of whatever. He had boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. But he still maintained his integrity. Servants of God get cancer too. Servants of God get all kind of diseases. But we don't blame God for it. We keep on fighting. Because we know we're born to die anyway. However means we're going to die, we're going to die. Whether it be natural or whether it be by some disease or by some accident, you are born to die. So whether you get a disease or an infirmity, blessed be the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Can we receive good and not evil? The Bible says those that live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer. Some of us suffer more than others. But we still fight. You got to fight that good fight. Let's go to, um, we finished that? No. Keep reading. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that, that was come upon him, they came everyone from his own place. Eliphaz from the, Tim, the Timonite, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Namathite, for they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off, they knew him not. They lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. So Job was going through it, boy. He was, anybody else probably would have put a bullet in their head at this point. But Job knew better. Let's go to Daniel 6. So we see things can happen to servants of the Lord that, are not out of the ordinary amongst what's going on now. You see, Isaiah had to walk around naked. Job was a rich man who lost everything, but he still maintained his integrity. He still kept fighting. He didn't go down for the 10 count. Daniel 6, and let's look at Daniel. He went through some stuff. And all he was doing was serving the Lord. That was it. But then you got some haters that was plotting against him, just like they do us now. They, they ain't plotting. They just waiting on us to slip. That's all they waiting for, us to slip. Daniel 6, and pick it up at verse 1. And let's see what happened to Daniel. Go ahead. And it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find none occasion nor fault. 
for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error fault found in him. So Daniel, he was, had a good, pretty good position, okay? But then you always got some haters. They get jealous, so they try to find something, find a fault in you to bring you down. But they couldn't find nothing with Daniel, because Daniel was a straight-laced guy. He served God, and the Lord blessed him. Go ahead. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. So they couldn't find nothing in his personality or his actions, so they went to his, the God that he served. They were going to try to trip him up that way, just like they try to do you today. When you want to keep this Sabbath, it's always somebody that wants you to do something on this day. And when you mean business, they, don't, they really don't think you mean business when it comes to Sabbath day. They think it's a joke because they don't understand what the Sabbath day really means. They think it's some kind of Sunday thing where it's just a passing thing. But no, people have parties on the Sabbath day. They have parades on the Sabbath day and want you to participate in them. But when you tell them, no, nah, I'm going to serve the Lord on this day, then something is wrong with you. They think you're crazy. But they just, it just takes one time for you to slip, and they just, that's all they do. They say, I got you. I got you. I knew that Sabbath day wasn't what it was, you know, turned out to be. Just like my mother was in the hospital. She had, got in, she had, got to, um, had to go to the emergency room that Friday night. I didn't find out about it till in the morning because it had happened like real early in the morning. So before class, you know, I went over there to see her, made sure she was all right, and said, you know, if you ain't dead, I'll be back. <laughs> you know, I'll be back after the Sabbath if you're still living. But it wasn't that serious. You know, I was just joking with her, but she knew I was, I was serious business, you know. You all right, moms? You cool? Okay, I'll be back. That's it. Keep reading. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So they came up with some trumped-up kind of decree to get Daniel, because they knew Daniel prayed three times a day to his God. So they're going to trick the king into signing this decree just to get Daniel. Just like if they could, man could pass a law right now that said you can't have no convocation on Saturday, you think that'll stop us? We'll be right here. Mm -hmm. And they just going to come in and do what they got to do. But yeah. Daniel knew about the decree, and he didn't even blink an eye. He did what, exactly what he did three times a day. He prayed towards Jerusalem. Go ahead. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but makest his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king, and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is, that no decree, no statute which the king establisheth may be changed. So now they done tricked the king into signing this decree, and now they got Daniel, and now the king is upset. But his boys is pushing on him. They were like, look, now you signed this dude. Because they wanted to get Daniel. 
But the king had to go. He had to go with it because he signed a decree. Go ahead. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of, the, of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste into the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths, that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him in innocy, in an innocy found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no man of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. And the king commanded that they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. So them lions was eating good. They couldn't eat Daniel, but they had somebody else. So these men got the, not only did they get themselves in trouble for their trickery, but they got their wives and their kids. Them lions was eating good for a long time. Keep reading. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall even be unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth. He worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Okay, let's go to Acts. Let's go back to the New Testament. Let's go to Acts. So Daniel's fight got him thrown in the lion's den, but the Lord delivered him. Just like he'd deliver us in any situation that we're going through. But you got to keep up the good fight, though. Because if you let your guard down one time, here come the knockout blow, and you down for the count. And ain't no getting back up from this one. Let's go to Acts chapter 6. Let's look at Stephen. 6 and 1, go ahead. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of, of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer, to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands upon them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So Stephen was full of faith and power and did great miracles among the people. So he was, Stephen had a good fight in him. And his good fight, well, we're going to see what happened to him, but... This brother was full of the Holy Ghost. He was powerful in the word. Keep reading. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them the, from Sicilia of Asia disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, 
We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. They set up false witnesses, witnesses which said, the man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the custom which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So now they started lying on Stephen, just like they do on us. They don't understand what we're doing. And when you try to present the book to them, they don't want to read no book. They don't want to read nothing. It's all what you got to prove what you're doing. And the only way you're going to prove what you're doing is to read it out of the Bible. And when you try to present the Bible to them, they don't want to read it. And it's simple. Open the book and read it. But then they lie on you. They don't understand what the Sabbath day is, so they start making up stuff. Like, when y'all, do y'all ever leave a house? What do you do on the Sabbath? You don't, you don't go nowhere? I mean, just stuff that you ain't never heard of that you ain't never talked to me about it, so how do you know what I do? I can tell you exactly what I do on the Sabbath day if you got a little time. Let's open this book and read it. But people's misconceptions, they don't know what the Sabbath day means, so they think you're doing something that's out of the ordinary. You know, like, y'all don't go nowhere, huh? Yeah, we go somewhere. You know, it's the day of rest. Yeah, we know it's the day of rest, but you're also supposed to have a holy gathering. And that's something we can read. But keep reading. Go down to uh, chapter 7. Go ahead. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharon. So they made up some false accusations against Stephen, and the high priest asked him, You know, is this stuff true, man? So Stephen gave a sermon. He brought it all the way down. He started from Moses and brought it all the way down to their face, to Jesus. And when he said that, skip down to verse 51. Go ahead. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? They have slain them which showed before the before the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. When he had said this, he fell asleep. So Stephen's fight... Sometime, you know, maybe he should have, you know, kept his mouth shut. But no. You can't do that when you're serving the Lord. He laid it down on the line, and whatever conscious wishes came from it, that's what happened. And it ended up costing him his life. But it didn't matter. He didn't keep his mouth shut. He said exactly what thus said the Lord, and they didn't like it. That's where it is today. A lot of people don't want to hear what thus said the Lord. They don't like it. They do not want you to tell them that Christmas is wrong. They don't want to hear that. Let's go to um, Second Chronicles. Because he said they prophets, you stiff-necked and heart, uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the word, which is the prophets have not your fathers persecuted. We saw, we read a couple of them. Jeremiah, he got beat up. Micaiah. And Ahab's day, they locked him up. But let's go to 2 Chronicles 36. But even though the servants of the Lord go through some things, they still speak what thus saith the Lord. I don't care how much your family hates you, you still talk to them. Mm -hmm. 
And eventually they'll figure out not to bring up the Bible when you're around or say anything stupid. Because you've been checking them for so long that now they get it. Don't say nothing that he can get you with. Just be quiet. Sometimes I just like to go over to the in-law's house and just watch the fight. But it always ends up with the book. <laughs> yeah. You know, eventually I ain't going to get invited no more. But I'm waiting for that day. But until then, my intentions are to go over there, watch the Super Bowl, watch the fight, you know, and that's it. But like always, they say something stupid. And they get hemmed up in the kitchen or in the living room. And that's how it is. So either they're going to stop inviting me or they're going to keep their mouth shut when I'm around them. <laughs> Let's go to yeah, 2 Chronicles 36 and read verse 15 to 16. Go ahead. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up be times and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no more remedy. So they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words just like they do us today. They mock us. Your family, your friends, they mock you. You know, they try to put you on the spot. Just like my mother did me, you know, when, you know, me and Shell was going through our courtship and I was bringing her in the words slowly. You know, my mother used the, uh, we were sitting down at the table, and she was like, Brian, I know you don't do Christmas, but Michelle, I'm expecting something from you. And I'm like, why did you do that? But she did it, and that's what you know. And then Michelle had a heart attack because she didn't know. But it's all right, though. You see what happens. She's still sitting out there. So my mom's chicory didn't work. Let's go to Acts 9. And every now and then she'll slip, you know, I always say my Sabbath day, you know, I know you what you're doing on your Sabbath day, and I, got to, I keep having to correct it. I'm like, Mom, it's not my Sabbath. Acts chapter 9, and let's look at Paul. Acts 9, and pick it up at verse 1. Because Paul was wreaking havoc in the church. He was right there when Stephen got killed. And now he was on a mission. The high priest sent him on a mission. And when you got some paperwork in your hand, he had warrants to get everybody that was serving Jesus. Acts 9 and 1, go ahead. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus who thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. So Saul, he pretty much got scared to death. The Lord blinded him. And took away his appetite for three days, and three, three days he didn't eat nor drink. He was pretty shook up. Go ahead. And there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints of Jerusalem. 
And here he had authority from the chief of priests to bind all that call on thy name. So everybody knew Saul's reputation. He didn't have no problem dragging women or children out in the street, bound in chains, and throwing them in jail. And plus, since he had writings from the high priest, that got him pumped up a little bit. So everybody knew about Saul. But go ahead. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Paul did a total 180 degree conversion. He went from being an evil man persecuting the church to somebody that's righteous. And we can read examples. It can be done. So Paul turned his, he turned his ways, but the Lord said, I'm going to show him how much he's going to have to suffer mm -hmm. for my name's sake. So even though Paul changed his behavior, he still had to suffer. Because the books say if you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer. Verse 17, go ahead. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way that thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell excuse me, from his eyes as it has been in scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And straight That's good. That's good on that. So Saul got baptized, right? He repented from all his sins, and he got baptized. Everything should have been cool. But the Bible says he was going to suffer. The Lord said, I'm going to make him suffer. And when you get baptized and you, and you got a clean slate, the Lord has forgiven you for all that past stuff that you've done, but you still got to pay. That's where the drama comes in your life. He's collecting for what you did. Because now that you came into this knowledge, and you're like, man, I better get this stuff taken care of. You get in that water, now it's time to collect. And we're going to see how much you are willing to serve him, how much you're willing to put up a good fight when all this drama starts happening in your life. You want to serve me? It ain't going to be no cakewalk. I'm going to bring some drama on you because you messed up. You was messing up back then. And now you're walking straight. I got to collect. So when I start collecting, don't waver. Get up, brush yourself off, and keep walking. Because I'm going to bring you down. He might bring you down to your lowest point before he bring you back up. Just to see. Or he may take you midway. It all depends on the Lord. However much you want to collect from you, it's up to him. But you're going to do some suffering. Let's go to um, Acts 14. And let's see Paul and some of his uh, sufferings. Acts 14, pick it up at verse 1. Go ahead. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the believing Jews stirred up the Gentiles. Unbelief. And the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode, they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. So they got ran out of these cities. They was preaching. And then you had some haters, like always, trying to stir up the people. And they were stoning them. So they booked up and went to Lystra and Derbe, and was preaching the gospel there. Skip down to verse 19. Go, and there, ahead. Go ahead. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, 
and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So they stoned Paul. He got up and went right back to preaching. Even though he was down, he got up, brushed himself off, and started preaching again. You cannot stop as a servant of God. You have to preach this word. You cannot be, have somebody intimidate you. How can they intimidate you? You got the sword. You can't be scared to speak up to nobody. I don't care who it is. Even on my job, I ain't scared to say nothing to my boss when it comes to this law. They want to do a hot dog party, you know, get some beef dogs, man. Get some beef dogs. It got to the point that they had a separate pot for me because they knew I wasn't messing around with that foolishness that they was trying to cook. And he's going to make the uh, comment, well, I'm not making no preference for, for somebody. You know, I wasn't there. I was just coming up on it. And I told him, it ain't no preference, man. This is the law. I don't eat no swine. But anyway, let's go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But eventually, you know, they got the message. The truth won out. What did they do? They had a separate pot just for me. So you do what you want to do. But I ain't eating no pork, beef, chicken, hot dog. It's going to be all beef. 2 Corinthians 11, and let's pick it up at 22, because look at some of the stuff Paul went through, because the Lord said he was going to make them suffer. If you're a true servant of God, you're going to do some suffering. Serving the Lord is not a cakewalk. Look what they did to Jesus. They killed him. So what you think they're going to do to you? They're going to kill you too eventually. We're going to read that. 2 Corinthians 11, pick it up at 22. Go ahead. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more and labors more abundant, and stripes more above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So all the stuff that Paul went through, he still made sure that he was keeping the law. He got beat five times with a ride. Stone, shipwreck, cold nights in the sleep, among false brethren, cold and naked, fasting and thirst and hunger. And besides those things, which the day, besides those things, my daily stuff I had to do, and I had to make sure the churches were taken care of. So I could drive, my job could be driving every day, all over the state. But when the Sabbath comes, boom, I'll be here if I have to drive from where I'm at. This resting on the Sabbath, this lazy Sabbath, I call it, you know, because we got multimedia out there where you could watch it. But that's, that's Sunday mentality right there. The Bible says have a holy, holy convocation. You want to be lazy just so you don't have to have a holy convocation. You ain't keeping no Sabbath. If there's a place where you can go to have a holy convocation, you're supposed to be there. The only reason these chairs should be empty is if you're in a hospital bed, you can't make it. I don't care if you worked all night. Get up and get down here. You can fall asleep in them chairs, they're comfortable. You made the gathering. But just because you got lazy, you don't want to get up. No, nah, it don't work like that. The Lord is watching, and he's taking notes. You may not wake up from that sleep. 
Now you done died in your iniquity because you didn't keep the holy convocation. All that righteousness that you just did, it ain't even remembered. Because your mindset was on watching it on TV or, you know, catching it on a computer. You might not wake up. And now look at you. You be waking up standing in line. Let's go to, um, we finished that? Yes. Okay, let's go to um, Hebrews 11. Lazy people don't make a good fight. They get knocked out. Because you got to train yourself for this good fight. You got to read this book. This is your training manual right here. You can't go into a good fight having no skills. You got to read the book. Hebrews 11, start at verse 33. Go ahead. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, Quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword. Out of the weakness were made strong, wax valiant in fight, turn the flight and the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now these are some of the servants of God. This was the fight that they was going through. This was a good fight they were doing. Women received their dead. Some escaped the sword, but some got tortured. But they took the torture because they might obtain a better resurrection. Go ahead. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yeah, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in the deserts and in the mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. So these are some of the things the servant of God went through, okay? Some were killed, some weren't. But the ones that weren't killed, believe me, they were suffering. They went through some stuff to serve the Lord. Let's go to um, Hebrews 12. Skip down right into Hebrews 12. Go ahead. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed, compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So look at the example Jesus set for us, okay? All the stuff that he went through, they ended up killing him. We ain't going through, we ain't resisted unto blood yet. It's coming. If you don't make it to that wilderness, it's coming. So we have not resisted unto blood. We're just going through a little family dispute, which will pass anyway. But some people are so close to their family, they'll fall. They'll go down for the count. They don't want to serve the Lord because it's too much for them. But you have not yet resisted under blood. Let's go to Revelation 6. Revelation 6, and we're going to read one verse, verse 9. Six and nine, go ahead. And when he had and we had when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So we see right here in this instance, people were going to be killed for believing in the word of God, just for their belief, their faith. They're going to get killed. Flip over to Revelation twenty. Read verse 4. Okay, go ahead. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So it's going to come a time during the tribulation, which is three and a half years, that your option is going to be either the guillotine or the mark. 
And that's the only choice you got. You take the mark and you live, or you don't take it and get your head cut off. Now, you believe that, you're going to be fighting. That's a good fight right there because you have not resisted under blood. Our faith has not been put on the line yet. We're just going through some emotional things with our family and friends, but when it boils down to it, you're either going to die and wake up in the, in the kingdom, or you're going to die and wake up in a lake of fire. Either one. The choice is yours. Let's go to um, Luke 14. Luke 14, and pick it up at verse 26. Okay, go ahead. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yeah, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So you pretty much got to hate everybody. In a sense, the love of God is a lot more powerful than the, compared to the love that you have for your family. It might be considered hate because you are not going to do anything to go against God, even though your family don't understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would be considered hate. So you got to hate your mother, your father, your wife, and your children. We're talking grown children here. Because your grown children, when you come into this world, your grown children will try to trip you up too. And your wife, and your brothers and your sisters, and his own life. You have to deny your own self. And once you do all of that, then you can be Jesus' disciple. But if you don't do that, he don't want to have nothing to do with you. Go ahead. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it. Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth con conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So it's a big cost to serving the Lord. You got to consider the cost. You have to forsake all that you have to serve God. You have to deny everybody. You have to practically hate everybody when it comes to the Lord. Because he is on the top of the list. Right. He is on the top. You have to please him first. Don't worry about everybody else. Mm -hmm. They'll get over it. Amen. But the Lord, don't forget, he's long-suffering. He remembers everything. So he says, likewise, whoever of you that forsaketh not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. You better consider the cost. This ain't no joke. You got to think about what you're doing. You don't want to do this? Fine. Just don't get baptized. Go on about your business. But it's a price in serving the Lord, and that price is your life. Let's go to um, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Read verse 13. Because like I said, this good fight is not a 12 rounds. This is the fight to the end. It's a daily fight. 24 and 13, go ahead and read it. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And that's your fight all the way to the end. Flip over to Luke chapter 8. But some people go down. Some people can't, they go down in the first round. Some people go down in the fifth round. Some people go down in the twelfth round. You done made it all the way to the, what you think is the end, and you get knocked out. And you don't get up. Luke chapter 8, and let's look at this example. Because everybody hears the word, and they like it. 
But sometimes they get knocked out. Sometimes they get knocked out quicker than others. But let's look at it. Luke chapter 8 and pick it up at verse 4. Go ahead. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on, ground, on good ground and sprang up and bear fruit a hundredfold. And when he, said, when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. So Jesus gave a parable to sower of seeds, okay? And now he's going to explain to them what this parable means. Go ahead. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. First round knockout right here. They heard the word, but it was gone just like that. Because everybody gets the opportunity to hear it. It's about how long you endure with it and how long you fall away from it. You can have it for 20, 30 years and go <laughs> crazy. And go crazy, I'm telling you. People have done it. You start getting all, watching all kind of foolishness, questioning what some kind of new, you got some new doctrine now. And next thing you know, you done floated on off into some other foolishness. Go ahead. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. So here these people, you can say they got knocked out in the fifth round. They had it for a little bit, but then circumstances came up. They decided, no, I don't want this. I, don't I can't deal with this word no more. It's, just too much. it's causing too many problems. Keep reading. And that which fell among the thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Twelfth round knockout. They had it all the way and got knocked out right at the end. They had it for a long time. And that could be any one of us right here. Everybody ain't made it yet. You ain't going to make it till the end. We are all susceptible to this right here. Anybody in here is on a and get knocked out in the 12th round. Just because you got the word, don't think you got it made. The Bible says you got to endure to the end, which means you can fall off before you get to the end. And when you fall off before you get to the end and you die in your iniquities, you could have 30 years of this word. One day you decide to walk away from it, that could be the day the Lord kills you. Yep. And your whole 30 years is wiped out. You're going to be waking up, standing in that line. Game over. Keep reading. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. And that's what we're trying to do. We got this word in us. We're bringing forth this fruit with patience because we know we don't have it made yet because the end ain't came. That's why we keep walking and keep fighting this good fight. We finished that? Yes. Okay, let's go to um, 1 Peter. And we got one more place after this. 1 Peter chapter 4. So like I said, this ain't no 12-round match. This is a, a daily thing. You got to fight every day. I mean, every day. Excuse my English, y'all. 1 Peter chapter 4. So whatever you're going through, just make sure you don't, if you fall, you get back up. Just get up, brush yourself off, get back up. Don't stay down. Because if you stay down too long, 10 count, you out. You out. First Peter 4, pick it up at verse 1. Go ahead. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise in the same mind. 
For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and an abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. So would you stop doing the stuff you used to do? And you start walking the straight and narrow path? Now they're talking about you. Because you used to, what's, you used to do this. What's wrong with it now? They're talking about you like it's evil now. They're talking evil about you because you don't do the evil stuff you used to do. But when you was doing that evil stuff, you was good. But now you ain't doing evil no more. You evil. That don't make no sense. Go ahead. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Okay, skip down to verse 12. Go ahead. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. So don't think this is a cakewalk, because the Bible says some stuff is going to happen to you when you're serving the Lord. Some bad stuff is going to happen, so get ready for it. Keep reading. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. So when people persecute you for keeping the Sabbath day, they talk about you for keeping the Sabbath day, hey, be happy. Because the book says it's going to happen. Because it says, if he be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Be happy. Don't worry, be happy. It's written. It's going to happen to you. Keep reading. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So suffer as a Christian, a real Christian, mm -hmm. a real Bible Christian, not a Sunday Christian, because I don't think they do too much suffering. Not on the level that we do. But if you're suffering as a real Bible Christian, it's God, God is glorified on his behalf. Go ahead. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So whether, wherefore, let them who suffer according to the will of God get yourself up and brush yourself off. Don't stay down. Because a lot of people who suffer, they let it get the best of them. And they end up doing things that they don't want to do, saying things that they shouldn't say, or eventually, if they suffer too much, it's a bottle of pills, some Jack Daniels, or a 38 slug to the head. Because they can't take that much suffering, so they end up taking their own life. But we suffer. We happy because we suffer. I mean, I don't like being broke, you know, but I'm happy. <laughs> First Timothy 6, and it's the last place. At least I know why I'm broke. <laughs> First Timothy 6, and pick it up at verse 11. First Timothy 6, and verse 11. Okay, go ahead. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. 